love is a burning thing and it makes a fiery ring bound by wild desire I fell into a ring of fire I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down 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 and the flames went higher and it burns 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 the ring of fire the ring of fire I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down 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 and the flames went higher and it burns 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 the ring of fire the ring of fire the taste of love is sweet when hearts like ours meet I fell for you like a child oh but the fire went wild I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down 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 and the flames went higher and it burns 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 the ring of fire the ring of fire I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down 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 and the flames went higher and it burns 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 the ring of fire the ring of fire and it burns 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 the ring of fire the ring of fire the ring of fire it is June 25th 2019 at 3 08 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. You've joined Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole, the story of the world's most underground artist and his journey 900 feet underground in the coal mining industry. Just got off my shift in the coal mine, and uh, tonight I was on section, which is why I was so late. We hot seated, and there was a breakdown with the man trip on the way in to relieve us, so it took extra long to get out. I was on 5 South section, the mains, which is the main uh, mine running south towards West Virginia. It's uh, five or six entries wide as opposed to the 8W which is only three entries. Uh, So typical section work had to load the miner with supplies. Uh, There were two concrete block walls that needed mudded meaning uh, there's like a joint compound fiber joint compound that you take rubber gloves and you smear in all the cracks Uh, it comes in five gallon buckets and you uh, you you smear it across the entire surface of the wall to seal up all the air fill in all the cracks and holes in the concrete block wall. So I did that for about an hour. Uh, Then we had to resupply the uh, supply scoop, but they took our motor, so we had no way to move the train in or out with the supply cars. So we had to pack all of our supplies uh, by hand meaning we had to walk the length of uh, five or six cars out to the scoop instead of being able to pull it into a cross cut and load right off of the rail car we had to carry our supplies to the supply scoop Uh, I did drive the scoop a little bit uh, down a straightaway tonight and uh, I think I'm going to be on section probably most of this week, but I'm not sure. I never know until the day I get in there. So we'll see, but um, going to be late nights. 
June 26, 2019 at 2.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. There are little placards above the main rail line as you go deeper into the coal mine. They're numbered and they mark the block block of coal in which you're passing. They mark the crosscut number by which you are going under. <clears throat> At about one half hour into my man trip ride, I see the numbers 96, 97, 98, 99. Is that a set of green eyes from a raccoon near the tracks that I see in my headlamp? No, it's the switch. For 5 South Junction. Worked on sections again today in 5 South. It was a good shift. Time went relatively quickly. Hot seat, 10 hour shift. Uh, beginning of the shift I had to carry some cable bolts up to the bolter there are three different size bolts that are commonly used in the section there are rib bolts which are four feet long maybe three feet long they hold the rib straps in there are roof bolts which are eight feet long but they're in two segments. You place one segment up into the hole then you attach the second segment that has a coupling that's threaded. You thread it partially and then you push it up into the hole. Usually with some resin goes in, that goes in the hole first. Then there are 16 foot long cable bolts, which are like steel cable with a bolt head at the end of it, that go up with a longer tube of resin and are used at uh, intersections, cross cuts, for added roof stability. So at the beginning of the shift we had to carry some cable bolts because the motorman took our cable bolt car and it was nowhere to be found. Luckily there were some hidden in a cross cut but it was about a 20 block walk back into the section with the cable bolts. Then uh, we had to spot some block near the tailpiece. The tailpiece is where the end of the belt is, where the shuttle cars pull up with their mountains of coal and let the coal onto the conveyor belt. Uh, we got two lifts of block and the section foreman actually helped me stack the block which was nice. He's a man probably in his fifties and uh, seems like a really nice guy he also supervised me driving the scoop again um, so did that then we supplied the miner at lunch break when the section guys were on and on lunch the out by guys the three of us loaded the miner from the supply scoop and the section boss helped load then we resupplied the supply scoop by hand. We did have a motor today, but we decided to do it by hand because the motor is a bad motor and there were 20 cars attached and the logistics just didn't seem to add up, so we did it by hand. 
It is June 27th, 2019 at 231 AM Eastern Standard Time, USA. You're listening to Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole, where I dig deeper into the earth to discover all the mysteries of physics. A lot of physics in the coal mine, machines operating, using laws of physics. Uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, law broken, I guess, is is gravity, holding up 900 feet of Earth with bolts. And that's what I did tonight on shift. We got. I was on section again. Hot seat. That's why I'm out at 2:30. Uh, was on section again. We had to set about six posts. So these are the six by six wood posts that you wedge in between the roof and the floor. Um, we were at an intersection of a cross cut and an entry and they mined out too much on the corners so we had to set posts out to make it safe uh, cut the post with a handsaw bow saw the first one we used was so dull that it took forever but we found another one that made the work go a little quicker uh, set those posts and then we were put on the boulder to bolt uh, hangers that the belt hangs off of. So this bolter, it had a double boom. It's about 20 foot long, runs on tracks like an army tank. And uh, in the front it has two booms and another mast. The mast goes up and wedges against the ceiling using hydraulics. Wedges against the roof, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and then the two booms can pivot out from there and get close to the ribs. Uh, each has a drill on it and you drill a hole uh, up into the roof. You drill about five feet and then you pull out and you put an extender piece in that's another five feet. And the drills themselves uh, are like a hammer drill, but the extender pieces are hollow and they have suction to suck all the dust right into the shaft of the drill itself. So we did about 17 or 18 of those hangers after you drill the uh, 10 foot of, well about roughly 8 foot because you're putting the 8 foot roof bolts in. Um, you put the resin, which is a tube that's about 3 feet long of re resin epoxy basically. It's in a little plastic tube, looks like a sausage casing. You shove that up into the hole. Then you shove the top of the roof bolt. Then you thread in the bottom of the roof bolt into the coupling. Then you run the bolt up into the ceiling, up into the roof. Sorry, I keep catching myself. That's the contractor coming out of me. You spin the bolt for about 30 seconds, mixing up the resin. You wait about a minute to two minutes for the resin to begin to harden. Then you tighten the bolt down tight till the uh, impact driver won't drive anymore. So uh, that was pretty much most of the shift. Uh, join me tomorrow if I'm on section when I explain what scooping the tailpiece is and dusting which we did a little bit of both tonight. 
It is June 28th, 2019 at 2.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. You're listening to the world's most underground artist, Mitch Miller, and his podcast, The Black Hole. Just got off my shift in the coal mine, 900 feet underground. And, uh... Worked on section again, 5 south section, the mains, there's 7 entries, and then cross cuts connecting them all. Uh, Tonight, we hung some curtain for ventilation purposes, which is basically like a plastic tarpaulin material, Uh, and then we were... Uh, scooping the tailpiece. The tailpiece is where the coal is loaded from the shuttle cars onto the conveyor belt and there's spillage from the shuttle cars as they drive from the working face to the tailpiece they spill coal in the entries and cross cuts and that periodically has to be scooped with the bucket of the scoop and put into the tailpiece onto the conveyor belt. Uh, So after that we had to move the miner out of one entry into another entry and we also had to move the loader and all the accompanying cable that goes with them which is an ordeal. Takes a lot of dragging with the scoop because the cables are so heavy. Remember these machines are tethered to a power center and the miner also has a high pressure water line going to it to spray the coal as it's being mined to keep the dust levels down. At lunch I saw another mouse. It came within a few feet of my feet. was scampering about. You may wonder, is coal mining a dirty job? It's kind of a no-brainer. Of course it's a dirty job. Some of the guys even say I get paid to play in the dirt. Um, There's dust everywhere. Dust falls down on your hard hat. Dust falls on your clothes. Dust falls on your face. Every once in a while there's a snap, crackle, pop of the rib breaking or the roof breaking and a little chunk of coal will come down. Uh, When I come out of the coal mine, my face is usually black, covered with black coal dust. Um, So I, I watched the episode where Mike Rowe, the host of Dirty Jobs, goes into a coal mine. This coal mine is much different, uh, much more modern, and uh, yeah, it's a dirty job. I can't say that I have ever met Mike Rowe, but the host of Cash Cab once followed me on Twitter for several weeks until he must have not liked a comment I made and dropped me as a... as stop following me basically that's my one claim to fame so I had to drag some cable along the rib to get it out of the way for the shuttle cars to come through there's two shuttle cars and they uh, the loader loads the coal onto the shuttle cars and then there's a built-in conveyor belt in the shuttle car itself so when it gets up to the tailpiece it can turn on the conveyor belt and unload the coal onto the main conveyor belt that takes the coal out of the mine. All these machines are tethered with uh, electrical cables and uh, you anchor them into the walls at pivot points so that the shuttle cars can move three or four blocks from the working face to the tailpiece. Coming up this weekend, I think they're doing a power move, which means they're moving the transformer up closer to the working face. 
June 29th, 2019 at 2.12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. You're listening to Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole. Uh, Just got off my shift in a coal mine, 900 feet underground. Worked on section again, 5 south. Rounded out the week, all week on section. Makes me wonder if I'll be there next week. Who knows? Um, We supplied the miner with uh, straps and bolts, glue, and um, then we had to move some items to make way for one of the shuttle cars to come a different route to unload coal. We had to move a bolter out of the way. This was a center bolter. Uh, It's a different machine than the double boom bolter I described before, but it runs on tracks like an army tank, and it just puts a bolt up in the center. You see, as the miner moves forward, there are bolters on the miner itself that do rib bolts and two roof bolts, one on each end or each side near the rib but then you have to go back through and put a bolt in the center of the strap so the two bolts on either end of the 16 foot strap hold it up against the roof then you come through and put a a center bolt in with this machine we had to move that out of the way Uh, then we detrashed a couple cross cuts and we uh, took the trash out to the train and restocked the supply scoop again. Uh, They're getting ready to do a belt move, move the belt up a block, which means they're moving the feeder, which feeds the conveyor belt up a block. So some belt men were on the section laying out the parts they need to construct the conveyor belt and move it up one block and there's going to be a power move. Both of those are happening tomorrow. I can't, looking at the 10 to 20 uh, cables that are strung all through the ceiling and on the ribs and the the roof, uh, I can't imagine what a power move entails. Um, Just dragging some of the line around on section this week there were a couple rat's nests it seemed like that had formed uh, where different cables became intertwined with other cables they even cut and splice a cable because it was too entangled to move uh, logistically anyway it's the end of the week and I want to wrap up my segment on health care uh, so do you think that it's right that a high school athlete gets injured and his family his or her family has to go in debt ten to twenty thousand dollars to get the proper surgery to make that athlete healthy again Furthermore, as a hypothetical, this athlete decides to go into the military to pay for college or whatever other benefits they see from the military, and they carry with them, or their family does at least, this twenty to ten to twenty thousand dollar debt from a surgery they incurred in high school, um, and the GI Bill it doesn't cover that. So essentially, this athlete, his family, his or her family had to outlay or take out a loan to get the good enough surgery to make them healthy enough to be qualified for military service. Do you think that's okay in our privatized health care system? Um, frankly, I think that the NFL should be ashamed of themselves. Here's a question. Why do the NFL teams in every city sign with the best, biggest health care system 
in that city. They make millions, billions, or trillions they've made over the past 40 or 50 years with some of the most healthy employees in the world, if not the nation. So why not use your front of the house management to coordinate your own umbrella health care system? Basically, you find the best surgeons by doing research and you have them on call and do the legwork for the best physical therapists, surgeons, and physicians. So that sports team has an umbrella call list of physicians, surgeons, and physical therapists because they can afford it. So what I'm saying is they should have done it 30 years ago, but why not form your own health, somewhat of a health care system instead of signing with the biggest and the best so that they can tout that they have the best athletes on their health care plan, on their commercials for the health care system. Why not do the little extra legwork so that some of these surgeons can do pro bono work or very cheap surgeries on high school athletes? So that's kind of another idea I have for health care. It's uh, why don't the professional sports teams use their organizational skills to to uh, put put up put together a list of the best physicians, surgeons, and physical therapists in that area, and then offer cheap sports related, you know, ACL, MCL surgeries for high school athletes if they've talked with a recruiter. So if they've talked with a military recruiter, they can get a cheap surgery should they become injured rather than being in debt their entire five, four or five year uh, service because frankly military personnel don't get paid that much and they're not going to pay off a loan they had for a surgery. So you can contact me on my website. There's a email form that you can fill out if you have questions about my opinions on other topics such as how do I feel about Trump's comments on the NFL players or other such topics that I could talk about at the end of each week. Please visit my website at www.plotm.com that's plot, P-L-O-T, M as in Mitch, dot com. On there you can see pieces of art I've made, uh, t-shirts that I've created, and short stories that I've written. So that pretty much wraps up my take on health care. Number one... It can be a single payer health care can be a Republican agenda. It would open up a multitude of industries for intelligent people like me to be entrepreneurs and be able to attract the talent that uh, they need to succeed in business. Number two, the universal donor, the universal blood donor, O negative should be paid by the federal government to get three separate opinions on any surgeries they might need and a database should be compiled using this information. And number three, professional sports teams should form umbrella healthcare systems.